and now is the director of theology for Arosha International. It's called the Director of Theology and Churches, I believe the whole big title is. Um, he can tell you lots about what he's been doing, but he's currently studying for a PhD on biblical theology and biodiversity and conservation at Cambridge University. And he's authored two books, which you can get hold of, in many languages. The one called PlanetWise, uh, if you're a French speaker, Dutch, German, Chinese, or English, or French speaker, there's a book for you. And the other book is called God Doesn't Do Waste. And then the only other thing I need to say is that I'm very surprised he's not wearing binoculars around his, his neck because he is a really passionate birder. And we're going to have his full attention because he can't see any biodiversity today. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, so our, our focus here is very much on climate, but I'm going to talk less about climate and more about a subject that, that we've been working on globally for much longer, and that's biodiversity conservation. And I think there are some lessons we can learn as we look at the links between the two, particularly about how faith and environment can work together, building on some of what we've heard earlier. So the global conservation movement has been going for roughly 100 years. Uh, and yet Professor Bill Adams in the Geography Department at Cambridge University says after 10 decades of effort, the threats to nature are not reduced, but redoubled. The 20th century saw conservation's creation, but nature's decline. The fact is that science alone and education alone aren't enough to motivate people to make the changes that they need. And in a very influential paper uh, a few years ago, Schellenberger and Nordhaus say over the last 15 years, environmental foundations and organizations have invested hundreds of millions of dollars into combating global warming, but we have strikingly little to show for it. Both in conservation and in climate change, we need to engage values of the heart. And the fact is that although in some West European and North American countries, it seems that re religion is becoming less relevant, globally, 82% of the world's population still say that religion is important in their daily lives. The fact is, most of the world remains religious, and in many parts of the world is becoming more so. Moreover, religions are important in that they, in many parts of the world, are the controllers of very important material resources. In a survey by WWF, they found that the major faiths were owners of huge areas of land, and many of them, partly through their pension funds, are also major investors. So the movement towards decarbonization has been given quite a big shift when first the Lutheran Church in Sweden, and now the Church of England, my own church in the UK, have decided to divest from fossil fuels. Religions can help point the way in these areas. Secondly, for many religions, nature has a value in and of itself, and certain sites are particularly sacred. The picture on the left is taken in Ethiopia, a place where you find that many of the best spots for biodiversity are in ancient forests around Coptic and Orthodox churches that have protected those forests because of their faith. And in many parts of the world, biodiversity hotspots overlap with places that are of great value to faith communities. Increasingly, the faiths are beginning to get active on that. And some, some of us have been quite slow on this, but increasingly faiths are beginning to get active. Well, it's the Sierra Club in the US, whether it's the Alliance of Religions and Conservation, which is a, a secular body, but working with religions around the world. And this isn't new. It was in 1986 that a gathering in Assisi, initially of half a dozen faiths, but since joined by others, made uh, clear declarations on what back then with slightly sexist language was called man and nature. Uh, I'm sure if they were doing it now, it would be humanity uh, and nature or personhood and nature. Uh, but the fact is that the world's faiths do believe nature is important. And in my own country, in the UK, when our government environment agency did a survey of 50 of the top environmental leaders in the UK, most of them extremely secular people. They asked them, what are the things that we need to do to save the crisis? And here are 
are four of their top five answers. Energy efficiency was the top one. Solar power, a treaty beyond Kyoto, which hopefully by the end of next week we may be nearer, and local energy generation. But I've left out number two because it shocked everyone when this survey came out. This was secular environmentalists saying what's missing is faith groups getting active. It's time the world's faiths remind us that we have a duty to restore and maintain the ecological balance of the planet. And one of the, the leading British environmentalists of the last couple of generations um, who has worked both with government and with business and with the NGO sector, Jonathan Porritt, says there are few sources of authority, let alone wisdom, in addressing these challenges that are not derived from religious or spiritual sources. So as Bishop F said, it's crazy to leave faith leaders away from the table at these major negotiations. To quote again from that paper on the death of environmentalism, environmentalists need to tap into the creative worlds of myth-making, even religion, not to better sell narrow and technical policy proposals, but rather to figure out who we are and who we need to be. And that's, I think, quite an important statement. So I want to look very quickly at four values that I think the Christian faith and probably other faiths too uh, can begin to offer into this. One is the value of, of interdependence. We are part of a community of creation. We are not species on our own with the rest of nature simply an object to be exploited. Psalm 104 is a passage in the Hebrew scriptures that talks about this in great detail. Uh, it's sometimes called the biodiversity psalm and I, I recommend it for your reading. And in that, we learn about the ethical value of wonder at the beauty, integrity, and intricacy of nature. So interdependence is the first faith-based uh, wisdom that I would commend. And the second one is vocation. The fact is that two basic ideas about the place of humanity and nature have been competing over recent decades. One is an anthropocentric or egocentric worldview that basically says the world is here for us and we can use it how we choose. The second is the ecocentric worldview, which basically says we are no different and have no greater value than any other species, nor we have, any, have we any right to interfere. And people have often thought that Christianity is ecocentric, is egocentric, sorry, because it says human beings alone were made in the image of God. And there's a, a long-standing debate uh, about that. But you could argue equally from passages like Psalm 104, Job 38 and 39, that the Bible is also ecocentric. There are many passages that dethrone humanity and say that we are simply one amongst the many creatures that God cares for. Ultimately, however, both these worldviews are not enough because one of them puts humanity above nature and allows us to destroy it. The other one makes us simply a random part of nature without any authority to intervene or take decisions on behalf of the rest of nature. What we need is actually a theocentric view, a recognition that the value that the earth, that our fellow human beings and our fellow species have derives from their creator, that they matter because they matter to God, and that humanity's place is one of serving and preserving at the bottom of that picture, not because we're the least important, but because we are a keystone species. The world does depend on us. We have become the most significant species in the impacts that we have, and we therefore have responsibility. Mm -hmm. For Christians, we need to move from an understanding of our vocation as one of simply saving souls to an understanding that recognizes that our vocation includes both human flourishing and the flourishing of the whole of nature. And that's a movement that is happening more and more in Christian circles. Faith also teaches the big picture, that we are part of a bigger story that is not just about us. And the Christian faith uh, has the concept of the earth as our oikos, as our home. And of course, that Greek word oikos is the root word both for ecology and economy. And don't we need those two to recognize that both of their jobs is about serving the whole of creation 
fact, if I put up this next slide, uh, it puts things the opposite way around from how most of our politicians and our economic values tend to operate. Normally, we subject both the welfare of human beings, particularly the poorest, and the welfare of the environment, which is simply seen as an externality, to economic growth. Mm -hmm. But in reality, if we're talking about looking after our home, the economic must always be the servant of the, of the social. And we must always recognize that we are dependent upon looking after the ecological domain that is our home. And then a final value I want to share, and that is localism. The importance not just of having a big picture, but about doing something practical at the local level. And the photo here is of a Sikh friend of mine back in West London where I live, who quoted to me from the Sikh scriptures saying, any tree without roots will cause damage. And it's the same with a child. The fact is, as human beings, we need to put down roots in the places where we live. We need to learn to belong and to care for our own backyards. One movement starting in the UK, but now working widely that does that is the transition movement. And that's also what Arusha is about too. It's about taking practical care for the earth, about expressing those core Christian values of faith, hope, and love in tangible form through practical projects. And whether that's, I'm gonna move on. We're doing that in about 20 countries around the world. And whether that's, as I saw in September, planting trees in Peru uh, to care for an important desert habitat there and help restore that, whether it's dealing with issues of human elephant conflict on the edge of Bangalore in India, whether it's caring for the poor and also caring for a forest with a number of threatened endemic species in Kenya, whether in Ghana it's about bringing together faith and in one case a campaign to protect an important habitat as a new national park, whether about it's in West London in the project that's very close to my heart, uh, restoring an area that had become known as a rubbish tip into a blooming uh, desert, a place of, of new life in the desert. Whoops, we'll go back one. Uh, and this is the, that was the before, this is the after uh, of that site there. So in conclusion, uh, we're now part with some of the other partners who are here in this room of a global movement of Christians working for creation care. And the reason we do this is because we believe ultimately that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Thank you.